we gather in this sacred space, made more sacred in this moment by the presence and connection of each and every one of us. Last week, we welcomed attendees by live stream from local cities and from Florida, Connecticut, and California. And last week, we again had audio issues at the beginning of our service. To our live streaming friends, we apologize. Going forward, write to the checking in email address or call the office if there are technical issues so we can hopefully address them soon. And friends of this week, regardless of where you're logging in from, we are glad you are here. In a spirit of welcome, I invite those gathered in the sanctuary to greet those attending from home by turning towards the camera near the welcoming congregation banner and waving and saying hello right from where you are. And those here in the sanctuary, let's take a moment to turn and greet one another. Good morning and welcome everyone to this morning's service of the Winchester Unitarian Society, a caring religious community devoted to spiritual growth, social transformation, and environmental responsibility. As a welcoming congregation, we affirm the full inclusion of people of all sexual, I, sexual orientations and gender identities. And as it says right up there in the order of service, happy Easter to all. And I note that it is also the fourth day of the Jewish holiday of Passover, a celebration intimately connected to Easter. The Last Supper was a Passover Seder, after all. And it is a happy occurrence that these two biblically connected holidays are happening at virtually the same time this year. And we should also recognize that they both fall within the sacred, the sacred holiday of Ramadan for those of the Muslim faith. We honor and celebrate both the Christian holiday of Easter, the Jewish holiday of Passover, the Muslim holiday of Ramadan, because as Unitarian Universalists, our faith does not require us to believe in a dogma, tenet, or creed, and among us we believe many things, and in fact, we are infinitely enriched by the open and non-exclusive nature of our faith. We prize freedom of thought and open, honest discussion and questioning, because these, we believe, enrich both our spiritual lives and our work in the community. Indeed, we can still say today proudly, as the first minister of this society, Richard Metcalf, said over 100 years ago, quote, we do not regard even the best creed as final. We look for new truths and new statements of old ones. We maintain the unlimited right of free inquiry. But while our faith does not impose any dogma or belief, we recognize that it does call upon us to do certain things. And among those, we recognize and affirm and celebrate the inherent worth and dignity of every person. In that spirit, we greet with joy and fellowship all who are here with us in the sanctuary today for our Easter service, both in person and those via live streaming. We welcome you all. We ask that everyone today remain masked until the conclusion of today's service because the children are going to be with us for the entire service. And please take note of a correction in your order of service. The second hymn is number 266, not number 66. If you missed the announcements this morning, you may, they, they will be displayed again at the end of worship. You may also access them via the URL printed in your order of service. Yes, make sure you don't turn to hymn 66. We don't know what it is. <laughs> uh, after worship, all are invited to coffee, refreshments, and conversation in the Sims Room, which is right behind the sanctuary, 
Those wishing to remain masked are invited to linger in the pews. If you are not eating or drinking, please consider remaining masked and socializing in the sanctuary. And now let us open our hearts and minds to the spirit of worship with these words. Easter is a holiday of miracles. It is life from death, joy from sorrow, celebration from mourning. Easter reminds us that all is never lost, that the story continues as long as we are here to tell it. Gather up your worries. We are going to bury them beneath the ground and watch them transform into flowers of hope pushing through the earth, reminding us on Easter morning that love brings us back to life, calls us from sadness, from grief, into a world renewed and alive and filled with joy once again. Come, let us worship together. I now invite Rebecca Vernelia to light our chalice. We dedicate the chalice with these words by Howard Thurman. The glad surprise carries with it the element of elation, elation of life, of something over and beyond the surprise itself. It is the announcement that life cannot ultimately be conquered by death, that there is strength added when the labors increase, that multiplied Peace matches multiplied trials, that life is bottomed by that glad surprise. Please now rise in body or in spirit to join in singing our opening hymn, number 61 in the gray hymnal, Lo, the Earth Awakes Again. I would like to invite all those who are young or young at heart to come forward for a story. Come on up. Hello, Alice. Hi, Zara. Come on up, guys. Don't be shy. 
Welcome. Come on up. There's Charlie, Emily, and Milo. All right. Welcome. So if I said the words, it's a miracle, what would you think was happening? Oh, that would be nice to marry your mama at Easter. You must love your mama a lot. Yeah. So maybe something special was going to happen, maybe unexpected or even impossible. Well, I think it might be something impossible, if that's what I heard. Has anyone ever witnessed a miracle? Yes. <laughs> I bet you have. Milo, have you witnessed a miracle? Not that you know of. Well... One thing that I think we can all agree on is that a miracle is usually something that's a little bit surprising, right? Like something that you don't see every day, right? So sometimes it's funny, though, what, what we end up being surprised about, you know? Like, like when you're waiting for spring to happen. What are some of the things you're looking forward to when you're waiting for spring to happen? Grass, yes. Zara. Flowers. Emily. Daffodils, yes. Warm air. Cora. Ooh, warm air. Reverend Heather's got it. Bunnies, Cora. Trees, Trees with their leaves, right? Yeah. What's that? Trunks. Trunks? Yeah. Oh, like tree trunks. Oh, yes. Tree trunks. Charlie, what do you look forward to? What's that? Guppies? Like in the pond, yeah? Ah, yes, guppies, yes, that's good. And so when we're looking for all of these things... I'm looking for cats. Okay. Nice cats. Nice cats, yes. It's always a good thing. I think there are a lot of kids in this congregation that are looking for nice cats. Yes. Right, that don't scratch. So even though when we're looking forward to these things, even though in our minds we know that these things are all going to eventually happen, right? Yeah. When that first brave little crocus peeks up above the ground or we hear the first peeper in the pond chirp or the robin sing in the tree, our hearts leap in surprise and joy, and Ma, right? And Ma, and yeah. Ma leap in too. Oh, and so does mine. And does yours, Cora, does yours leap in surprise a little bit? Yeah, a little bit surprise, yeah. So our hearts sort of get surprised and they say, oh, these things are really all going to happen. Spring is really going to arrive again this year. And it's joyful to realize that again, even though with our minds we know, with our hearts we're surprised. Some of you were in Spirit Plane, you heard the story about Rachenka's eggs. Did anybody hear that story? Yeah. yeah. Does anybody know Rachenka's eggs? Yeah. Rachenka is a goose. A lady babushka rescues her from being hurt. She has a hurt wing. Wing and Babushka names her Rachenka and rescues her. And as a thank you, as a thank you, Rachenka lays Babushka these beautiful eggs that are painted. They look like they're painted. And it's a miracle. And then Rachenka leaves when she feels better, but she leaves Rachenka another miracle. It's a little baby goose. Yeah. And some might say, well, what's so miraculous about a goose, a baby goose? I mean, it's not that it happens all the time, right? <laughs> yeah. Have you seen a baby goose? Yeah. But new life, just like the crocus and the robin and the peeper. Oh, wow, a big moose. That is miraculous. <laughs> so even with all of these things that are happening and the sun rising up every day, even though these aren't miracles like a goose laying magic eggs, they are everyday miracles that surprise our heart and fill it with joy. So 
enjoy those everyday miracles and keep them in your heart and celebrate them. So today, you are going to get a special little gift. Every one of us here will get a little gift, and it is a kit, a little kit to help us practice that joy of surprise. Yeah, and in this kit, there is a tulip bulb with instructions on how to start growing it inside. So you can practice noticing the miracle of new life as it grows. So those kits will get handed out later and you can take them home and start practicing. So for now, I invite you all to go back to your grown-ups and we're gonna continue with our service. I now invite us into a time of centering, first through words and then through a ritual, kindling of, a light, of the light, a time to light a candle here in the sanctuary or at home to signify a joy or sorrow that you carry within. For our youngest friends, we have some battery operated candles on the front table that we invite you to turn on. At the time of the kindling of the light, if you'd like a candle brought to you, please raise your hand. After we kindle the light, we'll be together in a time of shared silence. Out of the silence, we will sing hymn number 266 in the gray hymnal, Now the Green Blade Riseth. Before we begin, I pause to share some sad news previously published in our weekly newsletter. Longtime member Alberto Arauz died on Wednesday after a long illness. His passing was peaceful. Our love is with his wife, Zareen, and their family in this hard time. We are planning an informal gathering this coming Saturday, April 15th at 2 p.m. with a larger memorial for some time in the future. When I kindle the light, I will light a candle in memory of Alberto. Our meditation draws from a poem by Rebecca Parker, Choose to Bless the World. Your gifts whatever you discover them to be, can be used to bless or curse the world. The mind's power, the strength of the hands, the reaches of the heart, the gift of speaking, listening, imagining, seeing, waiting. Any of these can serve to feed the hungry, bind up wounds, welcome the stranger, praise what is sacred, do the work of justice, or offer love. Any of these can draw down the prison door, hoard bread, abandon the poor, obscure what is holy, comply with injustice, or withhold love. You must answer this question. What will you do with your gifts? Choose to bless the world. There is an embrace of kindness that encompasses all life, even yours. And while there is injustice that moves a holy disturbance, a benevolent rage, a revolutionary love, protesting, urging, insisting, that which is sacred will not be defiled. Those who bless the world live their life as a gesture of thanks for this beauty and this rage. None of us alone can save the world. Together, that is another possibility waiting. Let us now kindle the light.
This past week, our former administrator, Alison Barron, stopped by as she's visiting friends in the area. For those who remember Alison, she says hello. Over tea time refreshments, she described her drive from her home in New Jersey as like riding in a time machine, a seasonal time machine, as the signs of spring come earlier south of New England. When she left home, the flowers were blooming, the sun was shining, the air a warm 80 degrees. But with each mile north, the landscape became more gray and brown. Then she arrived in Boston where, as I've been describing it for the past couple of weeks, winter and spring are in a well-matched arm wrestling competition. <laughs> with neither one prevailing is the clear winner. But if she were to keep driving north, she would go even further back in seasonal time. Regardless of what the calendar says, north of here still looks and feels like winter. There is a Unitarian Universalist congregation north of here in Maine that celebrates its own annual ritual. Over the years, they have learned that while it feels like winter will last forever, eventually the trees show a hint of green and flowers begin their reach for the sun. Spirits, again, bloom. But the real sign of spring is when you hear the peepers, the small frogs making mating calls. Together, it sounds like some delirious, chaotic, yet beautiful orchestra singing out praises for love. It is a natural anthem celebrating the beginning of new life. So this UU congregation invites its members to call the church office the very first time they hear the peepers. And the first person to call the office to report this good news will be given something special in the next worship service, the golden peeper. <laughs> I have not seen the golden peeper, but I imagine it's a small frog statue spray painted gold. They are the stewards of this symbol of spring's arrival until the end of the next cold, dark, seemingly endless winter when they place it into the hands of the next messengers of spring's emergence. I think about this other congregation this morning as their unique holiday, Golden Peeper Sunday, is an example of what Brenna was talking about before. One doesn't have to live very long before we realize that one season will always change into another. The cycle of the seasons is one of the few things we can rely upon in this world. But no matter how many times we witness these changes, we cannot help but be startled by the small transformations to experience them in the words of Howard Thurman as a glad surprise. These signs of new life are both familiar and miraculous worthy of celebration. But the miracle of new life emerging around us is just one reason why we are in worship this morning. This Sunday, we join Christians around the world in celebrating Easter, the resurrection or rebirth of Jesus. For our youngest friends, here is a short retelling of the Easter story. Jesus was a deeply spiritual man who spent his days seeking to free people from physical and emotional pain and teaching that everyone deserved God's love. He taught that everyone deserved God's love through what he did. He became friends with people that those in power said were unworthy. Jesus' ministry affirmed that God cares most about the weak and the poor, while people often put the wealthy and strong in power. How you heard Jesus' message depended on how much you wanted to keep the human world as it was. Jesus became popular with people who had little power and was an enemy of those who were in control. The rulers saw that his ideas were dangerous, a threat to their ability to govern the masses. One of Jesus' followers, Judas, agreed to betray him for just a little bit of money. Je Judas helped the people in power capture Jesus. He was then killed in public through a method called crucifixion. Those who followed and loved Jesus tended to his body and buried him in a tomb, grieving the death of their great teacher and healer. But then a miracle happened. Three days after Jesus' death, the stone in front of the tomb rolled away, 
and it was empty. Somehow, Jesus was no longer dead. His friends and students saw him in different places and times until 40 days later, he rose into heaven. If I were to witness someone returning from the dead, that would not be an everyday miracle, but a miracle that would change everything. For another thing we can rely on in this world is the understanding that every being with a body that lives will one day die. This is one of the hardest things we humans have to deal with in life. Earlier, we shared the sad news of Alberto's passing. Having spent time with him and his loving wife, Zareen, I know that if loving one's family and community were enough, Alberto would still be with us. If attentive and compassionate care were enough to keep a body going forever, Zareen would have kept Alberto among the living. Our planet would have thousands more people on it, too in love with life and too beloved by others to transition to death. So, knowing the reality of death, how do we understand the Easter story? Some say the story of Jesus' life, death, and rebirth, or resurrection, is literal and true, proving that God can work magic among us. Some say that it was God's plan all along to bring Jesus to the human world as an infant, have him grow into God's messenger, and then to have him die, bearing the pain that we should feel for not fully embracing God's vision for us. Jesus' rebirth is proof of this divine plan, evidence that God gave us Jesus' life, death, and rebirth as a way to bless the world. But I believe that the Easter story is not a factual account of something unusual happening, defying everything we know about science but a story that is true in the way that a poem or a piece of art is true. The Easter story speaks of defying death, and we, the living, need reminders that while physical death is unavoidable, life continues beyond a body's final rest. Just like how the bare branches of the trees give the appearance that their lives are over, we need reminders that they will not grow the same leaves as before, but will soon bear new expressions of what we often call the spirit of life. If, like me, you don't believe that the Easter story is true, how will we worship and celebrate this morning? Just because we do not believe that God blessed the world with Jesus and his death, that does not mean that we do not believe in blessing or that the world does not need it. Thinking back to Jesus' story, one could say his ministry before his death was in itself a miracle, a glad surprise in a society hungry for love and desperate for power to turn upside down. If we hear Jesus' message and embrace the reality as certain as the seasons and cycles of life and death, that all are beloved and act grounded in this truth, we choose to bless the world. And when we choose to bless the world, we choose to defy the forces of death and serve the forces of life. As the Easter story is truthful in a symbolic way, there are symbols of death and life all around us, beyond the chill of winter and the warmth of spring. My colleague, the Reverend Susan Chorley, ordained a progressive Baptist minister and serving a Unitarian Universalist congregation, asked this Holy Week, how do we face the modern-day crucifixions we witness? Her question brings to mind many things for me. How do we face the violence of war? What do we do living on a warming planet? When will our wealthy nation put an end to poverty? And what is my relationship with all these life-defying forces? No individual can turn all these things around. And there are some days when it's hard for me to reach beyond my own needs and wants, if I am to be honest. But responding to Rebecca Parker's commission to choose to bless the world, this can happen every day. These blessings bestowed through actions large and small. 
I remember my own minister once observing in a sermon that a spiritual practice can be as simple as pick, picking up a piece of trash each morning on our walk to the subway station. For a time, that was my daily commitment, a commitment that grew beyond just one piece of litter. I began to look for trash to collect instead of turning away from its ugliness and becoming more attentive, a more attentive witness and servant to life. I formed a greater connection with the land between my home and the train station. The blessing became a mutual one. So this Easter morning, I affirm that resurrection is not an event, a noun, but something we do again and again whenever we act in service to life, a verb, in the way that flowers growing and frogs peeping are verbs. Resurrection is when, as I advise in most prayers at the end of memorial services, we pick up the work of the one who's died among us and continue it in their name and in the time that remains for us. On Easter, we remember that this work is to spread the gospel through our words and our deeds that all are created in love and to love we will return. Our work is to create a world reflective of this spiritual truth. Wendell Berry's poem, Manifesto, The Mad Farmer Liberation Front, is in itself an Easter sermon for all seasons. Berry commissions us in part to, every day do something that won't compute. Love the Lord, love the world, work for nothing, Take all you have and be poor. Love someone who does not deserve it. Denounce the government and embrace the flag. Laughter is immeasurable. Be joyful, though you have considered all the facts. Practice resurrection. We have now come to everyone's favorite moment in the service, when we are each asked to make a financial contribution beyond our annual pledge to the health and work of this congregation. One hoped for goal of our church is to encourage all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and in action. This indeed is the great end of all the world's faith traditions, to bring we human beings closer to the divine by acts of creation, generosity, and compassion. We are now asked to make an offering that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit, an offering that will help support this self-supporting church and its many ministries. This morning, as you see in your order of service, we share our gifts with the Nature Conservancy, whose mission is, quote, to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends their vision is a world where the diversity of life thrives and people act to conserve nature for its own sake and its ability to fulfill our needs and enrich our lives. Here are the different ways you can donate. Those in the sanctuary may give cash, checks, or donate electronically. You may also text to the number in your order of service or visit our website under the giving page. If you are visiting us for the first time, either in person or online, you are our guest. In-person attendees can find a physical visitor card in the pew racks in front of you. Please complete it and put it in the collection plate. That is the best gift you can give us today. Information about how to give online and how to complete the virtual visitor card will soon be shared with live stream attendees through text on your screen. The offering will now be generously given and gratefully received.
Those who wish to do so are now invited to join in the unison affirmation. We gather not for ourselves alone, but to use our common power to build the beloved community within and beyond these walls. We create and reaffirm the covenant this day to make justice flourish, to practice compassion amidst difference, and to embody transformative love. Please now rise in body or in spirit to join in singing our closing hymn, number 270 in the gray hymnal, O Day of Light and Gladness.
please be seated for the benediction. In a moment, the promise of new life will be placed in your hands as we prepare to receive this gift and go forth from this place. May we be awake to the presence of everyday miracles. May we be open to the possibility of transformation. And may we commit to play our part in the ongoing resurrection of love and the practice of serving life in all of its guises. Go in peace. Amen.
please join me in reading the words for the extinguishing of the chalice. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Today's service has ended, but our life of service continues. Now let us continue the conversation in the Sims room.